and it's going to be on the effects of climate variability and change on tuna and billfish across the global ocean. Um, so first, being in Seattle, I want to acknowledge that I'm on the unceded ancestral lands of the Duwamish people. Without them, we would not have access to this gathering today. So I ask that we take this opportunity to think deeply about the ways in which we benefit from um, the stolen land and call for us to support the livelihoods of Duwamish and other Coast Salish people who are very much still here by paying real rent. So um, these will be the four stories that I'll be telling today, and these were all um, research and uh, studies that came out of my PhD at UW. So um, I'll just read through it real quick, but don't worry if some of these words are unfamiliar to you right now. I'll, I'll be going into a lot more detail and hopefully you'll understand everything by then. So story number one will be about and how ENSO drives variability in oxygenated tuna vertical habitat space in the tropical Pacific. Story number two will be about repurposing ADCP or acoustic Doppler current profiler data to quantify ENSO driven variability in tropical Pacific mid trophic level prey. Story number three will be about the effects of future climate change on um, oxygen and how that's going to affect tuna and billfish. Story, and finally, story number four will be about how ENSO drives lateral separation of fad or fish aggregating device associated skipjack and big eye tuna in the western tropical Pacific. So diving right in, um, tuna fisheries play a critical role in economic development and food security in the tropical Pacific. So for example, um, the eight nations listed on this map with their exclusive economic zones or EEZs shown in white control 50% of the global supply of skipjack tuna, which is the most commonly canned tuna species. So through the Nauru Agreement, these eight party to the Nauru Agreement, or PNA countries, manage their tuna by limiting the number of fishing days that they allow in their waters every year, based on scientific assessments of the tuna stock statuses there. So if the stocks are not doing as well, they decrease those numbers of days that are available for people to come fish in their waters, for example. So these fishing days are um, once they're allocated, they're sold to the highest bidder, which is usually a large tuna fishing company. And um, the numbers listed on the map are the approximate percentages of each of the PNA nation's government revenue coming from just fees that the foreign fishing companies pay to access these EEZ waters. So you can see that this is a really important part of their um, government revenues. And this doesn't even take into account um, the economic value of tuna that they eat locally or tuna processing and small scale local fishing industries in the area, which provide thousands of jobs across this, this region. Um, so because of the, the importance of tuna here, we want to better understand how climate variability and change might affect the tuna spatial distributions and catches. So one of the biggest ways in which um, climate can affect tuna fisheries is by altering the quality of tuna habitat. So temperature, oxygen and availability of food are the most important determinants of habitat quality. After all, um, we, everybody has a desired temperature range that you want to be in and you all, everybody has to eat and breathe. So tuna are no different. And when changes in the climate alter these habitat conditions, tuna can respond in multiple ways. So they can move horizontally or laterally, I'll say sometimes, to where conditions are better, but they might end up um, outside of traditional fishing grounds and EEZs belonging to nations that depend on foreign fishing access income. They can also move up or down in the water column to find better conditions. If they go too deep, however, they might not be as easy to capture as usual. And if they crowd closer to the surface, they may be too easily captured and could get overfished. Um, if different species tolerate slightly different habitat conditions, Differential movements between the species can change by catch rates or alter predator prey interactions, potentially disrupting previously established food webs. So past work has looked at um, better understanding how climate driven variations in temperature can affect tuna habitat quality and catches, but prey and oxygen availabilities haven't been nearly as well studied. So that's what I wanted to focus on. Um, so to better understand how variations in tropical Pacific oxygen and prey availability might affect tuna habitat quality, and therefore like the stock assessments and everything else, um, I studied oxygen in story number one and uh, prey in story number two. 
Then in story number three, I looked at how uh, tuna spatial distributions in both the tropical Pacific and across the global ocean might be affected by uh, future climate warming uh, induced changes in ocean oxygen. Finally, in story number four, I looked at how climate variability can alter um, incidental catch rates of threatened uh, big eye tuna in healthy skipjack tuna fisheries. All right, so for story number one, and by the way, I'll have um, the story I'm on in this bottom corner here in case you get lost or confused <laughs> about which one I'm on. Okay, so for story number one, I studied how ENSO uh, drives near surface oxygen and vertical habitat variability in the tropical Pacific. And this was a paper published in Environmental Research Letters last year. So ENSO or El Nino Southern Oscillation is the main cause of sea surface temperature variability in the tropical Pacific region. For those who need a refresher, though I'm sure most of you have heard of ENSO, um, it's just a climate pattern that oscillates between two extreme phases called La Nina and El Nino. And these oscillations have really big uh, repercussions all over the world, including in Seattle. So um, here, for example, ENSO phase dictates like how much snow we get each year. And the consequences of ENSO are most strongly felt in the tropical Pacific, however, because it's centered there, and the tuna there are definitely affected by it. It's been shown, for example, that um, tuna catches vary greatly between different phases of ENSO. As you can see from these maps um, of tuna catch during La Nina phases versus El Nino phases, um, overlain with contours of sea surface temperature. And this is from a study in 1997. Um, so this past work looked at how variations in temperature might affect tuna catch changes associated with ENSO, but these changes can also be driven by variations in oxygen availability, which hasn't been studied. So my goals for um, this story or this, uh, this study were to characterize observed ENSO-driven upper ocean oxygen variability and its mechanistic drivers, as well as to analyze the potential impacts of these oxygen variations on tuna uh, habitat space. So we hope that ultimately this work will uh, illuminate the potential effects of oxygen on fisheries, food security, and economic development in this um, region, especially in the West where tuna catches are the biggest. So to do this work, we first gathered uh, profiles of temperature, salinity, and oxygen from what's called the World Ocean Database, which just gathers basically um, information from all the cruises people have taken between 1955 and 2017. Actually, it goes earlier than that, but the data starts being pretty, really good in about the 1950s. Um, so then for some of our analyses, we uh, bind these profiles of temperature, salinity, and oxygen onto five by five horizontal degree monthly mean maps. Our ENSO index of choice, for those who want to know, was the ONI, the Oceanic Nino Index. And so through analysis of this World Ocean Database data, um, we showed for the first time that interannual upper ocean oxygen variability is really strongly driven by ENSO throughout the entire tropical Pacific. So these um, figures here are longitude, depth, cross-sections that I made of the means and temporal standard deviations of oxygen partial pressure, or PO2, averaged over the equatorial Pacific between um, seven and a half degrees north and seven and a half degrees south, as shown in orange here. So I'll be showing oxygen um, for this story in terms of partial pressures, or PO2, um, rather than concentrations, because it's really partial pressure that drives oxygen transfer through animal tissue. And so that's really like the conditions that they feel rather than concentration. So um, what I call tuna hypoxic depth or THD um, is shown in black on these figures. And I uh, define that as the depth below which PO2 falls under a threshold that's considered dangerous for skipjack and yellowfin tuna, which are the vast um, majority of tuna species caught here. So this THD or tuna hypoxic depth thus um, describes the amount of oxygenated vertical habitat space that's um, available to tuna in the upper ocean. So the threshold that I used here was 15 kilopascals, and that was based on a bunch of lab and field studies. So from this cross-section, you can see that annual mean uh, PO2 decreases quickly with depth in the east, um, but remains higher below the surface in the west. And it's most variable at um, around 50 meters in the east and at, say, 100 or so in the west. Um, during El Nino, 
um, PO2 increases in the east and decreases in the west with the opposite occurring during La Nina. So where ENSO driven PO2 variations are greatest, um, so too are the overall PO2 variabilities, which um, suggests that that variability is really primarily driven by ENSO in this region. And so these ENSO driven variations in tuna hypoxic depth resulting from the variations in the upper ocean PO2 are largest and most coherent at the eastern and western ends of the um, equatorial Pacific and along the equator. Yeah. So within um, this spatial box that I call the Western Equatorial Pacific or WEP, um, these uh, tuna hypoxic depth variations lead to vertical habitat compressions of about 10.3% 10 10 during El Nino compared to mean conditions. And during La Nina compared to um, mean conditions, vertical habitat is expanded by about also 10% within this box. In the east, ENSO has the opposite effect. So during La Nina, low, low oxygen induced vertical habitat compressions of around 3% occur within this eastern equatorial Pacific or EEP box, while vertical habitat expansion of about 13% uh, occurs in the, um, during El Nino. So you can see that in both the WEP and EEP regions, El Nino induces larger THD variations from the mean than La Nina which is in line with observed um, asymmetrical effects of ENSO on basically everything else we know about too. So some of the largest ENSO driven variations in tuna vertical habitat space occur within the EEZs or exclusive economic zones of those eight PNA or uh, party to the NARU agreement uh, EEZs that I showed before. So I created this um, box plot to just look at those ENSO driven variations within these eight EEZs, um, then so general variations in tuna hypoxic depth within those eight EEZs alone. So they're laid out approximately from east to west, or sorry, from west to east. And um, you can see that these are pretty big changes between El Nino and La Nina. So um, va variations in tuna hypoxic depth of this magnitude can really affect tuna catchability with common surface fishing gears, potentially leading to, again, overfishing when you have habitat compression in El Nino years, for example, these red years, or um, uh, the fish escaping too much during these La Nina or these blue years that I show here. And um, migration of tuna out of the EEZ waters and into international waters towards the east when they're trying to when the fish are trying to avoid low oxygen conditions during these El Nino years may also um, negatively impact those government uh, revenues get from the foreign fishing companies as well as food security and livelihoods, of course. So just sum that all up, um, we found that ENSO drive near surface oxygen variability in the tropical Pacific, oxygenated tuna vertical habitats are compressed in the west and expanded in the east during El Nino with the opposite occurring during La Nina. And while the role of oxygen has previously been underappreciated, and so induced oxygen variations potentially drive tuna movements in the same direction as temperature to push tuna towards the east during El Nino, for example, as tuna seek out more favorable oxygen as well as temperature conditions. So because of this, um, and so driven variations in water column oxygen content should really be considered in models of habitat quality and tuna catchability, and especially those used to assess the uh, yearly stock, stock statuses. So projected changes in ENSO frequency and intensity uh, with climate change are still somewhat uncertain, but if frequencies or intensities do increase as we think they might, this would potentially lead to greater variability in this available uh, vertical habitat space and therefore potentially less stable year-to-year -year or predictable year-to-year um, -year supplies of tuna in certain regions. And some studies have suggested that uh, future warming may permanently shift the tropical Pacific into a more El Nino-like state in the mean. And if those predictions come true, the oxygenated tuna vertical habitat space may shrink kind of more permanently or kind of more in the mean in the West and populations may move eastward. And so we really want to um, continue monitoring these changes in oxygen over time. Um, seeing as there could be important effects um, on development in the region. All right, so now on to story number two. Um, so the second story is called Repurposing 
ADCP data to quantify ensor driven variability in tropical Pacific mid trophic global prey. Um, it's not published yet and is still a work in progress. So, okay, in story number one, I talked about ENSO driven oxygen variability that could potentially alter year to year catches of tuna. Here, I'm going to talk about analogous variations in prey availability. So, mid trophic level mesozooplankton. Um, which range in size from about 0 0.2 to 20 uh, millimeters, and then micronectin, what are those? Uh, ranging from 2 to 20 centimeters, are especially important sources of food uh, for tuna, both in the tropical Pacific and across the global oceans. So mesozooplankton include things like jellyfish and copepods, while micronectin include uh, squid, shrimp, and small fish, among other things. So in addition to feeding economically important top pelagic predators. These organisms can also play really important roles in the biological pump, which um, is the thing that moves carbon down into the deep ocean when they um, excrete their fecal pellets and via their diel vertical migrations between the surface and mesopelagic. And I'll show you, tell you more about that in a moment. So in spite of the importance of these creatures, distributions of these um, mid-trophic level species and their variations and space and time aren't very well known due to a lack of comprehensive um, observations. So this observational gap exists in part because traditional methods used to measure them, such as trawling and net toes, are difficult, time consuming, expensive, so it'd be really awesome if there was a cheaper and more efficient way to quantify the prey abundance. Well, it turns out there kind of is already. And acoustic data from acoustic Doppler current profilers, or ADCPs, are routinely gathered by all research cruises and most moorings. But its vast potential hasn't been realized yet by um, fishery scientists and biological oceanographers. Because up until now, the ADCP data has usually been used just to quantify the speed and direction of currents in the ocean, with biological backscattering from these metrophic creatures, usually just considered noise that they need to subtract out to figure out the um, current signal that they want. So part of the reason why this really rich acoustic data set hasn't, has been underutilized is because um, of the lack of established methods to identify and quantify the biological signal in the data. So in story number two, my primary goal was to demonstrate the novel use of an already existing publicly available global ADCP data set to um, characterize the distributions of these metrophic level organisms and look at their variabilities in both space and time. Um, I start by looking in the tropical Pacific, even though the data set itself is global. So alongside the scientific results, I also want to publish open source software package for using this ADCB data to compute the backscatter um, due to these organisms and to detect their diel vertical migrations. Um, I hope that having this kind of software really will promote awareness, both of the data set and, and use of the data set. So this data set that I used was called the Joint Archive for Shipboard ADCP, or JAS ADCP. You can see um, all of the cruises that are in that data set on this map. Um, so I downloaded all the data um, from all of this data, and it's between, um, it's about 2,000 something cruises and goes from 1985 to 2018. Um, there's probably more recent years now, but it's kind of uh, is like a year lagged. Uh, for uploading the data. So in general, um, one acoustic profile is taken every five minutes over the duration of a cruise. So you can imagine that this is like a lot of data. Um, but in, in total, it was about only 15 gigs. So even though it's quite a bit, it's it can kind of still fit on your computer, you know, which is great. And so I have to give a shout out to the people at uh, University of Hawaii, especially, especially Eric Byring, for um, managing and putting together this data set. Okay, so to compute the total volumetric backscatter, or SV, which is a proxy for biomass of these metrophic level creatures, I use this equation. Um, I don't think I'll be showing many equations. This, I think, is the only one, so don't worry. Um, so I just show it to say, to let you guys know, like, what all goes into computing this, this um, kind of biomass proxy. So the problem was that 
like only about four of the variables listed here were available for most of the cruises in that JS ADCP archive. And the other like five or so weren't readily available because as I said before, the ADCP data was traditionally only used to compute currents and it didn't really need those five like extra um, parameters. So to get all of those extra parameters, I had to go through a bunch of like really old, like 50 year old type of things like technical documents and textbooks and um, email a lot of people who worked at the instrument company to figure out like can they go back in their records and get some of these um, values for me and all that um, and whenever you couldn't go back and just simply get all those values from their archives um, you had to make some reasonable assumptions and calculate how big the errors associated with some of those assumptions would be. Um, I won't go into details on this but it, this turned out to be most of the work. <laughs> Um, so after I finally finished computing SV and getting all of those different parameters and variables for all of the cruises, I finally got to do the fun sciency part of analyzing the data. So here I'm just showing you what uh, data from one cruise kind of looks like. And this is the raw SV or total backscatter, that proxy for biomass. Uh, this is what it looks like. Um, and this is from the Western Tropical Pacific. So here we have depth on the Y axis and time of day. Uh, or just time, yeah, time of day, sorry, on the x-axis. And the brighter the color, so like the more yellow um, the color, the more um, creatures or con more concentrated the metrophic level prey are. So you can see that, interestingly, these little guys are um, moving up and down in the water column in a really, really regular way. And this isn't like, an artifact of the data or anything like this is really what these creatures do each day so if you didn't know like these um, creatures move up and down in the water column every day um, so each of these u's represents one day of this cruise and so um, this is what i was saying was those diel vertical migrations or dvms so basically what happens is at night you have um, the the critters go up going up to the surface to feed on other plankton and detritus that are more concentrated there. But then during the day, they migrate downwards to avoid being eaten by visually orienting predators. So when the sun is highest at solar noon, that's when they reach their deepest point in their descent each day. Okay, so I wanted to show how the total backscatter um, compares between the Eastern and Western uh, Tropical Pacific, kind of like those boxes that I showed in story number one. Um, so I averaged that total backscatter, that SV value, over all the cruise days within these two boxes. So this is the west, this is the east, shown here. And I averaged also that uh, total backscatter over the time of day. So that's what we have in these plots. We have time of day here with zero being uh, midnight and 12 being solar noon on the x-axis, and then depth in the water column on the y-axis. So the greener and darker the color, the more scatterers that there are. So the more metrophic level prey that there are. Um, and we can see that uh, the prey are more abundant um, <laughs> and the prey availability is higher in the east than compared to the west. Um, and we can also see that the DVMs or the diel, diel vertical migrations are a little bit shallower in the east compared to the west too. Um, so I wanted to more carefully pull out these DVMs by themselves. Um, so without just averaging over all of the data, wanted to pull out kind of each day's shape. And so I use this um, edge detection algorithm to do that. And what you get is kind of this. So um, comparing again, the West and the East, you can see um, as well as El Nino, sorry. So West, East, El Nino, La Nina. I have, um, from these plots, you can see that during El Nino, so these, this top row, more pronounced and deeper um, DVMs occur uh, here than during La Nina. So again, this goes deeper and is a bit more pronounced than during, oops, sorry, La Nina. Um, and then this is likely because during El Nino, there's um, more there's more light actually coming in to the surface of the ocean because there are less clouds in this area during El Nino. And because there's less um, light coming in, or sorry, because there's more light coming in, the creatures, the metrophic level prey actually have to go deeper to get away from those predators that can see them. So they have to go deeper to get 
that same level of darkness that they need to escape from those visual, visually orienting predators. So that was really cool to see. Um, and then you can kind of see uh, the same thing over in the um, Eastern Tropical Pacific. So we see that during uh, La Nina, they're more pronounced, though similarly uh, deep uh, DVMs. And um, here in the East, this time it's less cloudy during La Nina. So that would make sense for the DVMs to be more pronounced again when it's less cloudy and therefore having more sunlight at the surface, getting through the water column. So that was really cool to see. Um, so in sum, uh, story number two shows that ENSO drives sizable variations in micronectonic prey availability and diovertical vertical migration depths within the tropical Pacific. And as was the case with, with subsurface oxygen concentrations, these variations in prey should be considered in models of tuna habitat quality and catchability that are used in stock assessments. So hopefully the availability of um, easy to use software that calculates the total backscatter, that SV, and detects these DVMs will allow for more widespread use of this JAS ADCP and other ADCP data sets for biological purposes rather than just for measuring currents. All right, so story number three was um, part of a IUCN or International Union for the Conservation of Nature report on ocean deoxygenation which just means the loss of oxygen from the ocean with climate change. And this IUCN report was meant to inform um, policymakers, scientists, and general public alike. So it's supposed to be relatively uh, readable if you're interested. Um, the report dealt with deoxygenation's effects on um, many habitats and species, but our chapter was specifically uh, tasked to look at the effects on tunas and billfishes. So many of those species that we uh, talked about are shown here in these beautiful paintings by George Metzen. Okay, so though I've um, focused on the tropical Pacific so far, tuna are actually really important um, pretty much the entire world over. Taken together, the seven most commercially important um, tuna species make up the most economically valuable fishery in the world. And collectively, these seven species listed here and inhabit the entire ocean and support both artisanal and industrial fishing wherever they exist. So um, in total, almost 6 million metric tons of tuna are landed each year. And the estimated dock value or amount paid to fishermen um, for these fish is sorry, typically um, nine to $10 billion a year in US dollars, um, while the estimated amount paid by final consumers is usually upwards of $40 billion a year. So again, tuna are very valuable. So though they're substantially, though substantially less than tuna, um, landings of billfish are still typically in the tens of thousands of metric tons per year, with swordfish constituting most of the catch. And um, other billfishes, though, are really prized by um, recreational anglers because of their awesome acrobatic abilities and their crazy large body sizes that some of them can reach. So the point of this report was to figure out how oxygen availability will change with future warming in present day tuna and billfish habitats, to figure out how oxygen changes might drive migrations out of present day habitats, and finally to discuss potential ecosystem and societal consequences of these oxygen changes. So to do this, we analyzed 100 year into the future projections of ocean biogeochemical conditions from state of the earth our state of the art earth system models um, contained within the coupled model intercomparison 5 or CMIP 5 archive. So these models are amazing. They resolve everything from ice sheets to volcanic emissions to plant biology to ocean biogeochemistry. So just think millions of lines of Fortran code <laughs> that solve fundamental physical equations running for weeks on these giant um, federally funded supercomputers. And so we combined these 100 year model projections with data uh, on both horizontal and vertical ranges, uh, habitat ranges for our species of interest to look at what would happen to them. So first of all, um, when we analyzed these Earth system model projections, we found that climate change is expected to decrease oxygen concentrations throughout the mid to high latitudes. Um, so you can see that in this map uh, between 
200 and 700 meters depth, which is a depth range where many tuna and billfish species go to forage. So this map um, shows current day oxygen conditions between these depths. And again, this map shows those projected changes in those concentrations. And that's under the um, RCP 8.5 scenario, if you want to know about that. But that's basically, you can think of it as the sort of business as usual um, scenario. So the greatest, most coherent, and the most certain changes are projected to occur in the temperate North Pacific. So kind of this blue blob here, um, with large potential impacts on the habitats of swordfish, uh, yellowfin, big eye, and Pacific bluefin, um, and al as well as albacore tunas. So the smallest, least coherent, and least certain changes are supposed to be in the tropical regions, especially the tropical Pacific. Um, and this is due likely to unresolved model physics here. Basically, you have really complicated currents, but the currents are actually smaller than the size of the ocean grid inside these models, so you don't really resolve those well. And so that can lead to a lot of uncertainty in this region. Unfortunately, that region is also very important for tuna and many other things. Um, so this map that we created shows current day um, tuna hypoxic depths, as I defined in story number one. So they're shallower in the tropical regions and deeper in those uh, temperate regions. So you can think of it as tuna have more vertical space where there's these darker spots and they have less vertical space where th there's these uh, lighter areas. Um, so these tuna hypoxic depths are projected to get shallower, so that these red places, throughout um, most of the global oceans and that's going to reduce available oxygenated, oxygenated vertical habitat space for many species. Um, we found that by 2100, projected shoaling of the tuna hypoxic depths is greatest in the north temperate North Pacific, as well as parts of the Southern Ocean. So these dark red, dark red areas. And um, here I just summarized how various species of tuna and billfish may move in response to these projected changes in oxygen. Um, and I also show how oxygen defined habitat suitability might change if they decide to stay put, because we don't really know exactly what the fish will want to do. Will they move? Will they stay and maybe suffer a little bit more? We're not sure. So um, these responses on this map were compiled both from previously published research as well as for new research we did for the project, for our project. And so from this figure, we can see that in general, um, oxygenated habitat quality is expected to degrade and cause upward habitat compressions in most regions. Um, that's these minuses and yeah, so minuses most places. Um, then many species are, um, sorry, Many species are also predicted to move poleward, so that's indicated by these arrows going either more towards the south or more towards the north, depending where you are. Um, but you may also see some species getting confined to a smaller region, for example, here for Atlantic bluefin, where the habitat, uh, the oxygen driven habitat quality uh, makes you like it's getting worse here and here, but slightly better there. So you kind of go into this smaller area. And so where uh, the oxygen-driven habitat quality increases, so like here, and vertical habitat expansions are projected, the changes in the underlying uh, oxygen conditions are also least certain. So we're really least certain about, again, things happening in this tropical Pacific region. All right, so in sum, we sh in this uh, study, we showed that climate warming-driven changes in ocean oxygen content over the next century will most greatly affect um, species inhabiting the temperate North Pacific, where um, projected decreases in oxygen concentrations between 200 and 700 meters depths are greatest and most certain. So the species residing here include um, swordfish and yellowfin, big eye, Pacific bluefin, and albacore tunas. So the least certain projections of um, Subsurface oxygen concentration changes and effects occur within the tropical Pacific. Given the extreme economic importance of the tuna and billfish fisheries here, as I've talked about a lot, more attention should really be focused on reducing the model uncertainties in this area. And finally, we also showed that um, 
oxygenated vertical habitat space will be compressed across the global ocean and that the temperate North Pacific will again likely undergo the most pronounced shallowing of those low oxygen layers. And these future changes in the spatial distributions of tuna and billfish are likely to have important socioeconomic effects. Um, where targeted species decrease in abundance or move away from their traditional fishing grounds, fishers will have to spend more resources to locate and catch them, or they'll have to reconfigure their gears to target new species. But the thing is that um, there could be many constraints, economic, political, or regulatory, that can prevent these fishers from effectively adapting, especially if those species move across management or political boundaries. And um, smaller scale fisheries in developing nations um, relying on vessels with more limited range or low technological cap capabilities are also less able to adapt. And so this means that, again, this is another example of climate injustice. Like the communities most dependent on these types of small scale fisheries for their livelihoods and incomes will be the hardest hit by any climate driven changes to the tuna and um, billfish populations. So just another reason why we need to like have a just transition. All right, so finally, oops, the last story, story number four, is about separation of um, skipjack and big eye tuna uh, using public domain catch data. And this is a paper that was submitted to PLOS One and pre-printed on BioArchive. So a lot of fishing in the tropical Pacific happens around these um, fish aggregating devices or fads. So these can be made out of pretty much anything and they're just really objects you place in the water to collect algae, which then attracts things that eat algae, which then attracts things that eat those things and so on and so forth until you have these swarms of tuna that you actually want to catch hanging out at your fad or uh, fish aggregating device. Because all of the fish you want to capture are gathered here all in one place, um, this can be really efficient for your fishing. But because they these fads tend to gather a lot of different species together, you may also be capturing some species that you don't want to be catching or that you shouldn't be catching legally, um, in addition to the ones that you do want. And this can have detrimental effects on those incidentally caught species. Um, so for example, incidental capture of juvenile big eye tuna in these fad associated um, purstane fisheries that target skipjack have contributed significantly to degradation of the big eye stocks in the Western tropical Pacific. Um, so one way to reduce this incidental catch is simply to limit that per se fishing effort altogether. But the skipjack tuna stocks are healthy and economically important to many of those small island nations in this region as we've learned. So we should really try to reduce this incidental um, juvenile big eye catch while still maintaining current levels of skipjack as much as we can. Um, so the goals here were to um, find out where and when fat associated incidental big eye catches are smallest and also largest. And I um, also wanted to see if there were certain environmental conditions that could more effectively separate big eye and skipjack. Um, I won't show that here for the sake of time, but you can ask me about it after. Um, I hope that by uh, both fishers and fishery managers can use this information to make better and more timely decisions about which areas to prevent or promote fishing in. And uh, that would just depend on the how many skipjack versus big eye would be in that area at that time. Oops, sorry. So to do this work, again, I um, have so far just only used publicly available data. And this is the case for this uh, study too. So I downloaded all this publicly available um, per seine fisheries data from the Western Central Pacific Fisheries Commission uh, or WCPFC along with a bunch of oceanographic data that was observed by satellite, ship, float, you name it. Um, and the catch data was um, on a monthly time scale from 1967 to 2017 and is on this um, 5 by 5 horizontal degree grid. So these are maps that I computed of the mean, the annual mean, uh, fad associated skipjack and big eye catch per unit effort or CPUE, which is simply the average amount of species that you catch per time you set out a net on a fad. So from these two maps, we can compute the ratio of big eye to skipjack tuna caught, which is shown in this map here. And the higher this ratio, the greater the fraction of total catch is made up of big eye rather than skipjack. So 
we want to avoid that. So yeah, you mainly want to avoid the areas with the highest um, ratios, such as, for example, these bright yellow ones here. And this map is helpful, but really you want to kind of put these three together, hopefully into one map if you can, um, so that you can see them, see all of these variables at the same time. So I tried to do that here. Hopefully it's not too confusing, but um, I'll go through it somewhat slowly. So grid cells with um, check marks have low big eye to skipjack catch ratios, and they should be targeted if skipjack catches are also high. So while um, the grid cells with X's have high big eye to skipjack catch ratios and should be avoided if at all possible. So I also classified each of these grid cells into one of five types besides having the checks and the pluses, uh, or sorry, checks and the X's. Um, so the red grid cells are the least desirable with um, low skipjack catches and high big eye catch catches, while the green grid cells are most desirable because they have high skipjack catches and low big eye catches. Um, the orange and the others are all intermediate, and so you can look at those details later if you want. But um, basically, go for the green with the check marks and avoid the red with the X marks. So armed with that mean summary map, you'd think that that's basically the end, that's all you need. But the problem is that there's a lot of variability over time um, and space in both of these species catches. So just looking at a mean map may not really be the most actionable if you're trying to make a decision about what you should do this year or right now, this month. So um, as I explained before, ENSO is the primary driver of climate variability in this region. And it's also the primary driver of these big eye to skipjack catch ratios here too. So depending on the um, ENSO phase, the, whether it's El Nino or La Nina, um, you can get really different big eye to skipjack catch ratio and summary maps um, done the same way that I did that mean summary map. And so um, fishers and managers should re therefore really consider and so cycles, whether it's El Nino or La Nina, when they're evaluating promotion or prevention of fishing in certain areas. And right now they don't really do that. Every year they just have kind of the same areas closed or um, prevented or promoted from being fished in. So in general, um, El Nino lowers big eye to skipjack uh, catch ratios um, east of 170 east, so kind of these orange dots. So these waters kind of become more desirable in El Nino years, and then these waters kind of come, become less desirable in El Nino years and so forth, with the opposite happening during La Nina. So just as was the case for those tuna hypoxic depths in story number one, we also see these large variations in this big eye to skipjack catch ratio within those um, same PNA EEZs between the different phases of ENSO. So again, this shows that when you're choosing which EEZ to go fishing in and purchasing access to the waters for, you should really con consider which phase of ENSO you're in. So takeaways from this story are that fisheries and fisheries managers should use evidence-based analyses like this to determine regions in which to promote or prevent fishing in order to ensure the sustainability of big eye and other species and um, not to just kind of make a choice and stick with it same every year. And so the ENSO phase should be taken into account when determining um, the best tropical Pacific regions to fish in. And to just sum everything up, um, in story number one, um, I showed that ENSO is a primary driver of upper ocean oxygen variability on interannual timescales in the tropical Pacific. And oxygen, in addition to temperature, therefore likely plays an important role in changing available tuna vertical habitat space and um, causing their migrations between different phases of ENSO. So because of this, these ENSO-driven variations in oxygen should really be added into all of our models of these tuna, um, their habitat quality and catchability, especially those used to um, look at tuna stack statuses, which they don't currently do. So in story number two, I show that ENSO also drives sizable variations in these micronectonic prey availabilities and their diel vertical migrations within the tropical Pacific. And just as is the case with oxygen, these variations in prey availability should also be considered in those models of tuna habitat quality and catchability for stock assessments, which again, that variability is not um, really in those models right now.
So in story number three, I show that um, climate warming driven changes in ocean oxygen over the next 100 years will most greatly affect species in the temperate North Pacific. So where are populations of um, tuna and billfish species that are targeted, normally targeted, decrease in abundance or move away from traditional fishing grounds, we might have to, um, the fishers who, who get those species will have to either spend more resources to locate and catch them or they'll have to figure out how to catch new ones. And that can be especially hard for um, uh, fishers with less resources. And finally, in story number four, I showed that there are significant ENSO-driven variations in fish aggregating device associated um, skipjack and big eye separability throughout the Western tropical Pacific, which should be taken into account in both management and exploitation of these fish. So just an overarching summary, I've shown that climate variability and change can have profound effects on marine ecosystem processes on all scales whether it's those vertical migrations of tiny micronectin or to the spatial distributions of these top pelagic predators like tuna and billfish. Um, I've also shown that there are many ways that we should move forward in improving the accuracy of our models, whether that's um, better resolving climate variability or better establishing more detailed information on the biologically re relevant um, environmental conditions or say better um, resolving spatially those models that uh, have the, the uncertainties in the tropical Pacific. And lastly, I've shown that um, you can do a lot, a lot, a lot using only data that's already publicly available. So as I said, and I, I think I said before, um, every single data set that I used here that I showed you guys was, um, were publicly available, so. Um, just a big thank you to all the people who helped me with all of the science and especially all the people who actually went out and gathered all of this data and um, thanks to all of my funding. Um, that's basically it. I had a few slides about grad school for the undergrads and high school students out there, but I can just show those after questions perhaps or if anybody wants to ask about that.